Hey guys, Lamont here, and I've finally done the video that seemingly all language learning channels need to do at some point while they're growing up, which is an interview with Steve Kaufman. I tried to ask him some stuff that he doesn't get asked all that often, uh, so I think it went pretty well. Unfortunately, there were some technical issues, so I was just coming here to do this video to warn you of that. I've fixed them up as best I can, but it does show, unfortunately, but it works out okay. Also, to let you know that uh, the team at Link, since I did this interview, because I asked Steve about some things about Link that I don't particularly like, they've since offered me uh, a free trial so I can keep across some of the changes that they're hoping to make very soon. And they also gave me a link that gives you guys 30% off if you're interested in checking out Link. I've expressed criticism of Link before. I'm just being upfront with you about that, that it's not my favorite platform, but I know a lot of people really, really like it. So if you want to try it out, there's a link in the description that gives you 30% off that does also help me out. Hang around for the end of the end of the interview where Steve and I speak some Swedish and yeah, have fun. See ya. It's Steve Kaufman, polyglot speaker of what, 12, 13, 14? Yeah, languages? depending how you define it, yes. Yes. I've seen lots of people ask you questions like, where did you get into languages? How right. did you start okay. and everything? I thought I'd sort of try to ask you some questions that maybe don't come up so often. Okay. Do you think that too many people take language learning too seriously or that too many people take it too lightly? Which end of the scale would you say is that? I think a lot of people say that they would like to learn a language. Gee, I'd love to learn to speak Spanish and they don't do anything about it. Uh, I think that's probably the most common thing. Then there are people who study, who go to their local library and study Spanish for 10 years and never get anywhere. Uh, and I think those people probably, probably spend too much time on the nuts and bolts of the language, trying to nail them down rather than just letting the language come to them. So I think most people stop too early. Most people, I think a lot of people go to the bookstore, buy a book on learning Spanish, take it home and hardly open it. Uh, though, but then there's the other group that do go through their book and then another book and another book and they never get anywhere. So I think the, you have both people, people who take it too seriously, treat it as some kind of an academic chore. And then you've got the other people who talk about it, but don't do it. And somewhere in between, you have the people who enjoy it and do well. Because I've, I've recently decided that I want to get to a really high level in Swedish. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of saying that I was quite not disappointed, but I wasn't happy with my current level of Swedish. Right. People saying, well, you're taking it too seriously. And I just think that's a, a strange... Well, you know, I, I think it, it depends what people want to do. Now, if, if someone, you know, say lives in Sweden and just wants to be able to, you know, not be embarrassed in a store, although you'll, you'll hardly find anyone in Sweden who doesn't speak Swedish, but still. But personally, to me, if I'm going to learn a language, my goal is to get to what they call B2 on the European framework. Yeah. That means I will make mistakes. Uh, I will search for words. There may even be things that I don't understand watching a movie or I'm with five people and they're all talking in across to each other and I don't fully understand what they're saying. But by and large, I can hold up my end of a conversation on just about any subject without getting into nuclear physics or something. Yep. That's my goal. And I think that's a legitimate goal. Now, some people take it to they want to be like sound like a native or never make a mistake. To me, that's excessive. But to just want to be able to say, hello, how are you? Two beers, please. Where's the bathroom? To me, that's not a very ambitious goal, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So that, that's interesting because you say to, to you that's excessive and mm -hmm. to, to, to want to get to it's essentially the level of a native or at, right. least, at least. I wouldn't say it's excessive. I don't want to pass judgment. It's not something that I, I mean, like, because I study many languages, I mean, yeah, I would love to go back to my Japanese and make it better or my Spanish or my, you know, Russian or something. But I also like exploring new languages. So it's a, it's a matter of choice. You know, you, you, yeah. there's only so much time I have available for language learning. Both are legitimate to try to get as good as you can be in a language 
or to want to explore new languages. Both are legitimate. Yeah, that's something I sort of wanted to get into and you've just kind of answered that. So one of my mm -hmm. questions here was that the reasons for learning languages, people have their different reasons, but right. each, each kind of side or each perspective of a reason to learn a language sometimes seems to look down on the other reasons. Um, yeah, you know, with me, it's not, I don't look down on people for whatever, you know, whatever their activity is. Uh, however, whenever we are always not as good as we would like to be. I mean, that's, that's the sort of situation of a language learner. We, we speak our own language. We don't critique our use of our own language, but we are constantly not completely satisfied with how we speak another language. So obviously the more languages you have, the more you're in that situation of not being fully satisfied. So in a way, it's more that I, for my own reasons, want to get better. Not because I want people to stop criticizing me. We will always be criticized. If I make a video in language X on YouTube, somebody's going to get in there and say he's not very good, which is fine. Yeah. That doesn't bother. Yeah. yeah. yeah someone... <laughs> That's good. Okay. So when you spoke to Luca recently, yeah. Um, just, well, when we're recording this, it was just yesterday that that video came right. out. Yesterday, yeah. about my time. Um, he said that. And I know it's something that he said, but I, I'm assuming that you would agree with him that um, in order to learn a language, you should never do something you dislike. And obviously that sounds logical. So he, he has his bi-directional translation thing mm -hmm. with and he likes that. But that sounds like something most people would dislike. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard you say that, and I, and I agree with you on this, that you learn a language through input. Now, whether that's a lot of reading or reading with the audio or reading plus audio at a different time or whatever. You learn a language through your brain, assimilating the pattern of that language. Right. Working out. And I completely agree with you. What if essentially what you don't like is input? Right. If you don't like what well, Matt versus <laughs> Japan calls this a tolerance for ambiguity. So, that is yeah. when you don't understand something, just being able to say, okay, I didn't understand that. That's fine. Let's just keep going. Some people just seem to hate that. They only want to watch things that they understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if we are, you know, obliged to learn the language, then we have to do things that we don't like. Okay. It might be at school, university, your, your employer requires you to learn a language. You have to do it, even if you don't like doing it. But uh, I'm not in that situation, so I only do things that I enjoy doing. Uh, I would never do what Luca does. Uh, I think it might be a very good, a very powerful way of learning. But since I, I cannot, I might do it for half an hour, but I won't continue doing it because I don't enjoy doing it. Um, I think that a tolerance for ambiguity is not so much a task, it's a condition. I think if you want to be a successful language learner, you're going to have to uh, develop some tolerance for ambiguity because you're going from a comfortable environment, your own language, where you understand everything and you can say what you want to say and you may, you may even sound like an intelligent adult and you're going to put yourself in a situation where you won't understand, you won't be able to say what you want to say, so you're putting yourself in a situation where you're going to make mistakes, ambiguity. If you, if you can't tolerate that, you're not going to learn languages. That's, that's, I, that's not a matter of liking or not liking. That's just how languages are, you know, but as, so far as learning tasks, I don't like doing flashcards. I don't like doing drills and answering questions and comprehension questions and all this kind of stuff. So I simply don't do it. Whether that's useful or not, I have no idea. I don't think they are very useful, but uh, people who like doing them, certainly teachers and people who write uh, language textbooks like those things. Uh, I'm not convinced that uh, language learners like them and I don't think they're that effective. Yeah. So if you do things you like, you're likely to continue doing them. You're likely to put in the time with the language if you're doing things you like to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm always trying to find the balance between doing things that you like so that you're going to put in the time because mm -hmm. the time, like the, the amount of time spent in the language is what's most important. Right. But I also think that 
some things sort of to to overcome certain hurdles that you'll find along the way of mm -hmm. learning a language that it will take maybe not so much doing something you don't like but finding a way to like the thing that you didn't like before so Could be. i've yeah. sort of i've talked about this on my channel a bit of like just raising your tolerance for discomfort in general right so things like um i took cold showers for 100 days um back in december through through january so it was like the middle of summer but it's still i'd rather have a warm shower mm -hmm. and i found that even just that raised my my tolerance for things that I didn't enjoy and suddenly things that I didn't enjoy feel okay because at least it's not a cold shower. Like, <laughs> okay. And I've, I've, I also hated flashcards not very long ago, but right. I've recently come, come to sort of see the benefit in, in flashcards. So okay. That's, that's something I, I, I think we should rephrase it as find a way to. You know, I think with it, when it comes to flashcards, it's more a matter of, do you think they're useful? So if you think they're useful, you're going to do them. Yeah. I do flashcards early on uh, in link when I go from one page to the next. I won't go in and do a whole, you know, thousand flashcards. But if I have seven or eight new words on a page, when I turn to the next page, I'll review those new words. So I, it's not that I don't do them. I don't do them a lot. But if you find something useful, if you like reading about grammar, if you think it's useful, you're going to do it. So, but if you are convinced that flashcards are not helping you uh, or that you lose focus or you are convinced that reading grammar is not going to help you, you're not going to do it. But I think people find utility in different things and therefore they enjoy them because they think they're useful. Yeah. But do you think that sometimes people find utility, well, they, they think they're finding utility in things. And so they do a lot of them and they mm -hmm. feel productive. They feel like right. they're getting somewhere, but really what they're doing is not, th their brain is not going through the process of learning a language. It's going through another process. Like oh, another absolutely. Process. No, no question. I mean, you know, reading a dictionary would be a perfect example. You read through a dictionary and it's kind of fun. You're seeing all these words, some of which you know, some of which you don't know, and you think you're actually doing something, but I don't think your brain is getting used to the language. Uh, similarly, when you read a lot of grammar explanations, I mean, every time I, if I'm reading a, a, or doing a language where there's lots of conjugations or declensions, I come across a new word, uh, I will have a conjugating dictionary. So I look up that conjugation and I read through it and I, it feels good to see all the different conjugations. But I think I, I retain very little of that. So there are a lot of activities like that where you think you're learning, but I don't think you're actually learning much. Well, and that's why I, I spend a reasonable amount of time on my channel criticizing duolingo because mm -hmm. i think it's very good at making you feel like you're doing something yeah because you're sort of getting these answers right but mm -hmm. you're spending so much time in english and very often you're translating from the target language into english so you're really right. just writing something in english right. and people say that i get a lot of people saying like i'm doing this much duolingo even for something like french and mm -hmm. I think, well, in French, you can pretty much just go straight to target language stuff and just difficult it out. text. You got half the words are, are there. Yeah. Try Arabic, you know. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and I do. I do actually think that Duolingo is more useful for the v very far removed languages like Arabic and Chinese. No, no, I didn't like that. I tried it for Arabic and Hebrew. I found it useless and Greek. Mm -hmm. not, not, not for me. But maybe I didn't spend enough time yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get that. Oh, you're not going to get any defense for Duolingo from me. Don't worry. Okay. At any rate, I think you have to invest in any system. If I had spent more time with Duolingo, I might have, you know, become a fan. Yeah. Well, how often would you suggest that a learner um, rethink their system? Because I do think that there's value in, in investing in Duolingo very early for someone who's not at all used to learning languages. So an adult mm -hmm. taking up their first foreign language, particularly if it's further removed from English, I think there's value in uh, giving maybe three months to Duolingo. Yeah. Then, I didn't spend enough time with Duolingo, so I'm, I'm really not in a position to comment. So about not spending enough time with something. So um, I watched one of your videos with Moses recently and um, I mean, Moses is like, 
you, you mentioned Matt versus Japan in that right. video, but you didn't mention him by name, but I, I'm guessing that's who you were talking about. You said you spoke to this guy who knew all about Japanese pitch accent and everything. Mm -hmm. And you said that it's, you know, it's like going to a buffet and, and you and Moses have sampled like lo little bits of all the different parts of the buffet. Right. Or, 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 sorry, all the different things at the buffet. Do you think maybe that analogy is not, I mean, obviously all analogies are slightly off, but do you think that's not quite fair in that if you're getting to say A2 in a language, and I know your, your goal is to get to B2, but Moses said that some of his languages, he's happy with A1, A2, because he's mm -hmm. studied like 50 of them. Do you think maybe by doing that, you're sampling so little of the language that it's, it's not even really f fair to say that you, you sampled it because it's not as if, it's not like with food where the, the meal's gonna taste basically the same all the way through. You're going to get to a very different understanding of that language where you experience it in a very different way when you go as far as Matt has on Japanese. Well, if we take Moses at one end and Matt at the other end, um, you know, if you just explore a language, get to A2, but you have a sense of that language. He has a sense. What's Estonian? What's Georgian? What's Hmong? He has some sense of what those languages are. That's valuable in itself. So I see value in that. That's absolutely interesting. Um, I see less value in what Matt is doing, but it's all a matter, it's just a personal uh, position here. Um, I lived in Japan for nine years. I did business in Japanese. I am comfortable, 100% comfortable in Japanese. If I were to work on improving my Japanese, I would uh, do literature. I would listen to audiobooks, read, read them on link, learn, you know, increase my vocabulary, in increase, you know, how well I use the words in different situations. I would not worry about pitch accent. Uh, no one talked about pitch accent, you know, when I was learning Japanese, so it can't be that important. I honestly don't know what it is. Uh, I'm sure it exists, but it's, it's pursuing something that is relatively unimportant, something that varies from region to region in Japan. Uh, use of words, vocabulary, comprehension, the ability to speak in a way that makes people feel comfortable uh, in terms of how you use the language. These are far more important than trying to nail some aspect of pronunciation. Uh, I have dealt with so many foreigners speaking English who have a noticeable accent and who use the language so well that I'm in awe of how well they use the language. So I consider that to be more important. And my, so I, you know, it's a B2 plus, I call it a C1. That's kind of my goal. That's where I would like, if I had more time, I would take, a, I would want to take all my languages up to C1, but I wouldn't want to take them to C2. I wouldn't want to spend that additional time other than in terms of enjoying the literature and enjoying history, enjoying interesting content in that language. And therefore, by the way, I would improve my, my language skills. But I mean, it's, you've just said there that you see less value in, in doing that. And I, I know that's not the same thing as saying, as in, sorry, going very high. I know that's not the same thing as saying uh, that, that no one should do that. You're, no. you're not saying what. But I'm just saying what I like to do. People, there are people who are, you know, uh, Olympic divers. They got to be perfect, you know, when they enter the water and all the rest of it. To me, uh, I like uh, reading, I like uh, listening to podcasts, watching movies, I like communicating with people, uh, I want to be comfortable when I speak with people. If I can do all of those things, I'm happy. And if I continue doing those things, I will gradually improve. But my goal in then continuing to do those things is not necessarily to improve. My goal is to enjoy the language. So if someone says to me, your French is C1, okay. If you, someone says it's C2, okay. If you say it's B2, that's fine. Yeah, I don't care really. Yeah. I enjoy what I'm able to do in those languages. Yeah. And in the languages that I don't speak as well, I would like to speak them better. And uh, it's only through using them and, and, and listening and reading that I, I will gradually get better. But the goal is to enjoy the languages more, to have more time with those languages. It's not to fill the hexagon. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I was thinking about this yesterday. 
I think I've become as interested in the process of getting, particularly of getting very good at a mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. as I am in the language itself. So okay. I'm, and for me, that's Swedish because that's, that's the only language that I had. Well, that's the best language that I had other than English. Okay. So I decided to do that in Swedish, but I, I really enjoy thinking about this. Okay. It's because it's sort of harder in a way to go from that intermediate level to a high level mm -hmm. than it is to just get to the intermediate level. Right. Um, so I, I think I really enjoy just thinking about, well, how does one become an Olympic diver? How, do, mm -hmm. what do you need to do? What's the next step in the training kind of thing? Good question. Yeah, I, I would say, based on my experience, if I look at my best languages, which are Japanese, Chinese, and French, not, not in that order, uh, I think audiobooks and then reading the corresponding, um, texts, if you lack vocabulary, which would be the case for me in Japanese and Chinese, maybe not so much in French. But I find that listening to audiobooks, well narrated, uh, works on your pronunciation, works on your, I'm talking about literature, like, you know, fine literature, uh, really elevates your language. More say than fiction, like I like reading history, but history doesn't, like literature is, that's where you have craftsmen in the language. And to the extent that you expose yourself to that, I think it really elevates your language. Yeah. Well, I, I completely agree with you. I love audiobooks. I always, I basically won't buy a book or I won't obtain a book if I can't also get the corresponding audiobook. Mm -hmm. and, and I always read and listen at the same time. Um, but I think even then, for me, where the gaps really open up is uh, in the very little, the kind of small talk. And I don't mean small talk like how's the weather and everything. Just the the way even that I'm speaking now, how I take my pauses and mm -hmm. everything. Whereas I can, I can recite like a whole paragraph of a Swedish audio book, but that doesn't sound like a Swede because no one talks how they do in audio books. So that's, that's right. sort of something I'm working on, watching a lot of right. YouTube and mimicking them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's difficult to achieve if you're not in a place where the language is spoken. If you're in Sweden and you're with friends and then you sort of pick that up. I'm a great believer in sort of developing your, your potential in a language. You know, they talk about business English and academic English, and I've never really believed in all of that. If you have a high level um, in terms of your comprehension, your vocabulary, having listened to a lot, you've got a sound base in the language, you now have the potential to move in one or other direction. So that if you have a lot of reason to use it for business, your business English will develop. If you have a lot of reason to use it for some academic purpose, that will develop. If you are in a situation where there's a lot of small talk happening and you're listening to people say things, then that's going to happen. But it happens if you've got a solid base in the language and you can build up that base at home. But sometimes to reach that higher level, you actually have to go there short of going there and using the language a lot in real situations. That additional ability is not, is very difficult to develop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it is probably easier these days now that we've got more, um recordings essentially mm -hmm. so things yeah. like youtube of people talking more naturally so mm -hmm. it would have been harder even if we'd had something that was called youtube in the 60s we right. would have had a lot more people sitting in chairs reporting on on the news rather than just sitting there talking about their thoughts on things that that sort of wasn't a thing in the in the 60s 70s i mean not not recorded not recorded mm -hmm. recorded was always with studios and lights and everything right but yeah audiobooks uh and that i sort of mix it up so i have this like very modern crime fiction series in swedish that uses a lot of slang a lot of you know, sort of english mm -hmm. swedish because that, right. that is that's their slang these days um but then then i have very fine things that are that you'll never see an English word in the, mm -hmm. unless it, unless it's a, obviously a proper Swedish word that is also an right. English word. But, right. Um, 
but yeah, completely agree with you on audiobooks. I, I should bring this up, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to you and, sure. and, and the team at Link. Right. Um, because I've mentioned it on my channel before, some people might might sort of question why I didn't raise it with you personally. Right. I have tried Link, mm -hmm. and I, di I didn't enjoy it because I, not because the idea of it is bad. I love the idea, but I, the interface and and the user experience even the colors and things were were quite off-putting to me mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if we're if we're going to see um if that's something that link is considering like up upgrading the the user experience right i mean we are working on a major uh, rehaul right now which probably will be available sometime in the summer and of course, Link has gone through a number of different, uh, you know, interface um, gyrations, and it's not something that I'm involved with. Uh, my son Mark runs Link, and we have a team of uh, programmers and, uh, you know, graphics people, and whatever they choose to do, that's what they do. And so, in terms of the functionality, in terms of the color, uh, I like. I'm happy with it. It's uh, better now than it was. It certainly went through a period where. I think it was quite clunky and and uh it's it's been a you know it's it's a lot of work and it's it's gradually evolving uh right now i mean i do most of my link work on my ipad and on my iphone very rarely on the computer um the uh what i am now using on my iphone and ipad is the beta version of the new format which i find much more pleasing than the other format okay. uh, there's still things that they're working on to refine it uh, so yeah I think that Mark and his team are constantly working to try and make the functionality smoother uh, the you know appearance better uh, user interface you know experiencing uh, better so yeah that's obviously something that we we think about how can we make it better how can we make it better and so they've been at it now for quite a few months. And uh, as is so often the case, the deadline keeps on receding. But hopefully sometime in the summer, you'll see a, you know, Link 5.0. So I'm quite excited about it, actually. But I'll, I'll stay updated on it. Sorry. Sure. See what I think of the, see what I think of the changes now. Um, also, I think to bara att vi kunde prata lite svenska. Är det okej okay för dig? Ja, det kan jag göra. Jag har inte pratat mycket svenska sista tiden här, men det, det, det kan vi göra. Nej, men du, du, du låter ganska flytande när du sa skild när man tänker på faktumet att jag byter utan att fråga dig. Vi bara byter och så. Ja, det är alltså det. Jag har gjort mycket affär i Sverige. När jag... Du vet att jag är född i Sverige. Ja. Och sen eh, när jag var fem år så flyttade vi till Kanada så hade jag glömt helt och hållet. Men eh, sen eh, har jag lärt det tillbaks liksom. Jag har lyssnat mycket på Herman Lindqvist, historien av Sverige. Det var jätte... Jag tyckte mycket om det. Jag har många, många svenska ordböcker här. Ljudböcker här. Jag, det var liksom en tid när jag arbetade mycket. Vi köpte vilka i Sverige som vi säljer till Japan. Så har jag använt, jag har lyssnat mycket på svenska och eh, har jag arbetat mycket i Sverige och det var, alltså fast eh, alla, alla svenska, alltså de, de pratar engelska men eh, vi hade, jag måste arbeta med de som eh, arbetade i sågverket och för att förklara vad det, det, krav på kvalitet som var, japaner ville ha. Så det, det, det var enklare att förklara det här på svenska. Så jag, jag har använt svenska i den där tiden, men de sista 20 år har jag nä, nästan inte pratat svenska. Okej, okay, men det är jättebra om du inte har pratat i 20 år. Mm -hmm. Det är jättebra att du fortfarande kan, och jag har märkt att du kan bra svenska. Så du använder ganska stort ord för ord och um, ja det och för mig det här är inte en dålig sak men du lät ganska nästan norska så det var det västkusten att du det kan vara jag, jag vet inte nej de alltså 
hur ska man säga, vi, vi arbetade mycket i Småland och i Dalarna. Småland och Dalarna, de, det, det är där som man producerar alltså, virke. Och, men det kan vara, jag, har, det, jag vet inte. Jag vet inte, det, det är så där som jag pratar, förstår du? Ja, jag, jag har hit, nej, jag tycker att om jag tittar på en norsk serie till exempel mm-hmm. så börjar min svenska låta lite som norska. Så mm-hmm. det, jag, uh-huh. jag börjar gå upp på slutet av mening, liksom mm-hmm. så här. Så ja, det ja. är, ja, um, men smålandska, det eller, ja, man det är annorlunda, annorlunda. Det är... Ja, det är, de, yeah. de har ju inte R och S tillsammans. Yeah. När R och S blir tillsammans i mm-hmm. vanlig svenska så blir det sh. Ja, ja. i, I småländska så säger de R och S. Mm-hmm. Och, ja. Ja, det, jag, jag tycker att det är svårt att inte härma hur man pratar när jag pratar med någon från Skåne eller Småland så, så vanligtvis pratar jag precis som dem ja. och så det tycker jag är svårt för att utveckla mitt svenska uttal mm-hmm. jag vill bara utveckla ett, ja, ett uttal ja så. men det är Alltså det, det, det händer inte med sin egen språk, men med de språk som man har lärt sig så är det jätteenkelt att vara liksom att, att det här påverkar. Till exempel jag ska till Sydfrankrike så ska jag börja prata liksom de pratar där. Är jag i Quebec så börjar jag låta som en, en Quebecois. Så är det, så är det. Ja, ja, ja. Det, det händer faktiskt med mitt eget språk. Jaha. Om, så är, om, det beror lite på vem jag pratar med. Så om jag pratar med en eh, kanadien, kanske jag vet inte, men de, en som är från kanadien, mm-hmm. nej, Kanada, Kanada, Kanada ja. en, en, då skulle jag inte låta som jag, jag vet. Kanadenserna. Mm-hmm. Men, ja. ja, kanadenserna, ja. Men, men om jag pratar med någon från England så mm-hmm. är det ganska vanligt att jag byter till en lite som storbritanniskt uttal mm-hmm. um, så det är bara en det beror lite på vilket uttal vi pratar om ja, ja. Um, och ja, min syster uh, är amerikanare eller mm-hmm. hon, hon växte upp i, i USA mm-hmm. och så uh, när jag pratar med henne så låter jag lite jag börjar låta lite mer amerikansk och hon mm-hmm. börjar låta lite mer australiensk ja, alltså. Ja, det, det kan hända och jag tror att det är faktiskt en bra sak mm-hmm. för att för om man vill lära sig språk är det mycket bra att man härmar utan att veta att man härmar mm-hmm. någon så är, ja, jag tycker om det jag tycker om det när jag gör det men förlåt jag tycker inte om det när jag gör det på mm-hmm. engelska mm-hmm. men jag tror att det är faktiskt ett bra betyg i huvudet att mm-hmm. man kan göra så. Mm-hmm. Ja. Mm-hmm. Ja, bara. Jag tycker det händer inte med engelska för mig tycker jag. Det är bara på andra språk. Så. Men också, ja, ja det, det, liksom, det kan hända på andra språk men inte på engelska. Engelska är för att liksom. Och vi har här i Kanada här vi immigranter från jag vet inte Skottland eller Australien och de sätter att prata som de pratar. Ja, nej, det finns de som kom här när de var unga, unga så de börjar liksom blanda australianska och kanadiska engelska men mm-hmm. ja. jag, jag tror inte att skottländska skulle äh, skottländare skulle sk- skulle byta deras uttal nej. någonsin. Nej. Jag har hört till och med en no, jag hade en fransk lärare som, som berättade för mig att hon hade en elev som var skotts mm-hmm. och, um, och han pratade franska med ett skotskt uttal och jag sa okej, okay, finns det ett skotskt uttal på franska? Och han sa ja, jag tror att det finns ett skotskt uttal överallt det, ja, det spelar ingen roll var man befinner sig i världen ja, det, ja. det finns ett skotskt uttal så, Ja visst, ja. det är det... Hårt. Mm.
Ja, det är hårt och det är, mm. hårt. Det är ganska svårt att härma också. Jag, jag tycker om att försöka låta som en skotsk ibland för att mitt namn är liksom Lamont McLeod så det är mm. jätteskotts namn det är ett, right. så, ja. men jag tycker jag tycker i alla fall att det var jätteroligt att prata med dig på mm. ett annat språk det är Aha. liksom ett, en dröm som jag har haft okay. så jag, jag står fan så. kan jag fråga varför du lär, äh, mm. lär dig att prata svenska ja det började faktiskt som ett skämt med med en vän så hon, hon var finlandsk mm-hmm. och hon kom hit och stannade hos oss några dagar och vi hon sa ju att, jag, jag tror att det började med hon sa att hon hade lärt sig svenska i skolan mm-hmm. att det är, det är en sak i Finland och Um, jag sa att det kunde inte vara så svårt för att finna, finlandska, finska, förlåt, ja, finska yeah. är jättesvårt. Yeah. Så uh, hon sa, okej, okay, kanske är det inte så svårt men jag skulle säga att om du lärde dig svenska skulle det vara svårt för dig. Och så mm. sa jag, okej, okay, jag ska lära mig svenska. Yeah, yeah. Men det var bara ett skämt. Men uh-huh. så sen började jag och jag hittade... Människor som du och Olly Richards och så vidare. Och ja, jag började liksom göra det på allvar. Och, um, ja, och det tyckte jag om bara. Och efter ett år så började jag lära mig franska också. Men det var inte en bra idé så tycker jag för att jag inte var flytande på svenska vid den tiden. Så ja, jag, nu för tiden har jag trängt undan franska lite äh, mm-hmm. nej, trängt undan helt och hållet och jag fokuserar på att bli jättebra på svenska så Jaha. Ja, det, är bra. Men det är bara jag, jag jag hade liksom vad du säger, the bug ja, ja. Att, men det finns så många så många eh, resurser, så många ljudböcker på, på svenska och jag vet inte vad det finns, för jag, jag lär mig inte svenska, men jag tror det finns mycket, mycket. Det är liksom nu, jag håller, håller på att lära mig arabiska och persiska, och det är lite svårt att hitta bra resurser. Men i alla fall, det är intressant. Det är det mest uh, viktiga. Ja, oh. yeah. so, but yeah, as I said in the Swedish, it was, um, it's just, it's very cool to be able to talk to you. In English, but also in another language. Oh, well. Ditto. Ditto here. Okay, well, good luck. Good luck in your Swedish and eventually, I guess, your French at some point. Yeah, when I when I pick it back up. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I want to... Yeah, thanks very much for... Not at all. This. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Okay. okay. So, thank you.